And we're going to continue, as I've already said, what we started looking at this morning. And what I want to do is, is approach it from a, a text in the Old Testament that um, I think is, is given to correct the problem that existed in the first generation of believers that perished in the wilderness. And it's not that the first generation didn't have sufficient knowledge, but I do think that um, uh, Moses here in particular is warning that second generation as they're preparing to go into uh, the promised land, uh, uh, warning them and telling them where the first generation failed so that they might set their hearts to do what the Lord has called them to do so they don't end up in the same situation. So let's, uh, let's read Deuteronomy 6 in verses uh, 1 through 9. This is what Moses writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. By the way, this is a blueprint for um, Christian households on, on how we are to raise our children. Uh, if any of our children ever wondered why they got such a strong dose of, uh, of God's commandments as they were uh, being raised, uh, this is the reason. Because the Lord has charged us as parents to train our children, to teach our children to go in this direction. Now, we can't change their hearts but we can at least make their behavior while their children conform to what it is that the Lord calls them to do, and we can pray that the Lord might change their hearts. But I do, again, here believe we see the key, uh, what, again, the first generation was missing and what it is the second generation needs to do and what we need to do in order to honor the Lord. Now, again, just by way of review this morning, we were looking at how our experience as believers should be decidedly different than those who are unbelievers, than those who do not know Jesus. Uh, we believe that if we are true believers in the church, that we will do more than uh, what many today do, which is simply profess faith in Jesus. They believe the Bible is true. Well, again, James says that demons believe and they tremble. We'll do more than just simply join a church or be baptized, meet together and worship the Lord on His day and eat his supper. We were reminded this morning the Jews in the wilderness had the old covenant counterparts to, to all of these things that we have. Remember things that we're looking forward while the things that we have are looking back. Now they had things that could have saved them and could have built them up in the Lord Jesus Christ if they had believed, if they had genuine faith. But as we were reminded by Paul this morning in 1 Corinthians 10, most of them were laid low in the wilderness, which means most of them were destroyed in God's judgment. Uh, those that wandered from the wilderness for 40 years, remember all the men of war, every single one of them except Joshua and Caleb, died off and many of them died in specific judgments because of particular sins. As Matthew Mead put it in his book, The Almost Christian Discovered, we can have all these things, we can do all these things, and yet still be but an almost Christian. A number of the things that we base our Christianity on today, or at least evangelicals base their Christianity on today, are things which a person may have and still not be 
converted. There has to be more. There has to be, as we saw this morning, a spirit-empowered devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. There needs to be the image of Jesus being formed within us. There needs to be the seeking after God's glory. Making choices that aren't focused on just what makes us happy and what pleases us, but rather finding our pleasure in what pleases God. We also saw there needs to be a sensitivity in us to those around us, not using the liberty that the Lord has given to us to either give unbelievers a reason to reject Jesus or to encourage weak believers to sin against their consciences. Again, Paul was talking about uh, the fact that we have the liberty to eat meat sacrificed to idols, uh, but yet we don't want to use that liberty to, um, again, offend, to create a stumbling block for people coming to Jesus or to stumble a weak believer who may think it's sinful, but our example encourages them to do this. Instead, we'll use our liberty uh, in a way that will glorify God, that will please Him, and will also help those around us, help them find Christ, help the weak become strong in the Lord. If I can put it in these terms, I, I think what we should see in ourselves is the kind of devotion that we saw in George Whitfield. Uh, George Whitfield was unique in a variety of ways, but he shouldn't have been unique in this way as far as how much he loved the Lord and wanted to honor him. Remember, George Whitfield set aside the pleasures of life uh, and the comforts of, of house and home in order that he might courageously preach the gospel. He did that in his own country. Remember, in uh, the face of the opposition that came to him both from the church, I mean, they hated him, and the people that he went out to preach to, the number of them didn't, uh, didn't like him so much either. We hear stories about the various things they threw at him, including, I think, uh, as we often hear, the pieces of a dead cat. It wasn't exactly uh, pleasurable to do this. Uh, he made numerous trips uh, to the States, spending several months on the sea, in order to preach Christ here in the colonies, or in the colonies, uh, even to the established churches, which by that time had become basically uh, dead, centers of dead orthodoxy. They had the right forms. Again, we can have the right forms, we can go and do the right things, go through the right motions, but they didn't have the heart. They no longer loved the Lord and wanted to give Him glory through these things, they just wanted to keep up the appearances, and so he came to preach to them, and he also came to establish uh, institutions to take care of orphans. Uh, his life was marked by uh, ex just extreme labors and sacrifice for the Lord. And the reason why he did these things was because he was devoted to Jesus. He loved him, and he wanted to honor him, so he wanted to do what the Lord called him to do in his word. Now, we know it's not exactly the recipe for a, a long and comfortable life. Uh, his life wasn't long, and his life wasn't comfortable. He, he died at the age of 55, which in those days wasn't so bad because most people died in their 30s. But he didn't live on as he might have otherwise, um, and he certainly didn't enjoy, again, the pleasures of life as, as he might otherwise. He gave himself in this way that he might please the Lord. Now, we may not have Whitfield's gifts and callings. I, I think it's safe to say we don't have these things. Uh, we don't have the, uh, the gifts of an Apostle Paul. We don't have the intellect of an Edwards. We don't have the evangelistic zeal of a Whitfield. We don't have the skill, perhaps, to preach like a Spurgeon. But the fact is, if we have the Holy Spirit, which we do for true believers, we do have Whitfield's heart. We have Edwards' heart. We have Spurgeon's heart. We, because we have the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's what the Spirit of God produces within us. And so we have the ability within ourselves to aim our lives at the same goal for which God made these others and for which He made us, which is to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. Now this evening I want us to consider how to live for God's glory. You know, it's, it's, it's more than just simply saying that's what I want to do. It's what God created me to do. 
uh, Lord, help me to do this. We, we need to know what exactly is made up uh, in giving him glory. What are the different elements? What do we need to be careful to do? Well, that's what the Lord tells us in our passage uh, this evening. Now, remember this morning we saw what happened to most of those who came out of Egypt with Moses. Uh, the author to the Hebrews quotes what the Lord said through Jeremiah in Hebrews 8, verse 9. For they did not continue in my covenant. They didn't obey me. And I did not care for them, says the Lord. By the way, this is the problem that the new covenant corrects, right? Because the law written on stone could not give one the ability to, to obey or to keep the covenant of God. But the Spirit writing that law in our hearts certainly could. Now, he was doing that in the Old Covenant as well as in the New Covenant, but apparently in the Old Covenant, uh, not many of them had that uh, going on in their lives, particularly in that group that came out of Egypt. But here we see Moses speaking to the second generation, those children. Remember the Lord said to those men of war, you're not going to enter into that land, but your children whom you were afraid of or afraid for that were going to be destroyed in the land if we entered in, I'm going to bring them in. Well, now the generation has died off. Now the Lord is bringing the second generation in, the children of those who were in Egypt and who died in the wilderness. And from what he says to them, we again see why the first generation failed to enter into that land and what the second generation has to do differently uh, if they want to enter the land and stay in the land. And that we see in uh, verses 4 through 6 where Moses says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And those words would be the laws, the statutes, basically the law of God. The first generation failed in that they did not circumcise their hearts through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who was to come. They didn't apprehend and apply Jesus to themselves through the types and shadows, which, again, God gave them to them for that very purpose. And so they didn't love the Lord, they didn't obey His word, and they weren't seeking after His glory. And again, we saw many examples of that uh, this morning. Now, by the way, this, this is the same reason why no matter what any unbeliever does, you know, what we call, um, again, sometimes we, we look at the people around us. Uh, I remember uh, Bob Strimple giving this example in seminary so many uh, moons ago. And he talked about a, a young man who went to seminary, got all fired up for preaching the gospel, and he was going to go on in the mission field. So he, he starts on his way out there, and, and essentially as he's, he's taking buses and going various things, he runs into a lot of people from different religions. And he runs into people who seem like they're very outwardly moral and, and very nice people who do a lot of nice things. And he began to ask himself the question, why am I going to the mission field to preach Christ to them when it appears to me that they're already nice and good and they don't need him. Well, the problem is they're, they're not that nice and they're not that good, even if they appear to be, even as uh, God's people whom we brought out of Egypt, even though they were in the church and had all these things, weren't necessarily good because they lack certain things. The Bible tells us that unbelievers can't please God as long as they are in their unbelief because there are certain things that they cannot do. Same thing the Jews couldn't do, and so ended up being destroyed. And we read about these things. I, I thought I would um, sort of take liberty here and read a, a section of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a very useful document and, and a shortcut to learn what the Bible teaches. Well, this is what we read in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 16, verse 7. And listen to this because this not only tells us why they can't please the Lord, but it also tells us how we can please the Lord. He says this, or the assembly says this, works done by unregenerate men, although for the matter of them they may be things which God commands, 
and of good use, both to themselves and to others. When we do what God commands, it not only helps us, but helps other people. Yet, because they, that is the good works they do, proceed not from a heart purified by faith, nor are done in a right manner according to the word, nor to a right end, the glory of God, they are therefore sinful and cannot please God or make a man meet to receive grace from God, and yet their neglect of them is more sinful and displeasing unto God. So even though they might be doing you know, what God commands, and even though it may appear uh, as it did to the man as he was going to the mission field, that the things they're doing are good things. They really aren't good things. They may be useful to them and to others, but they're not pleasing to God because they are lacking certain things. Their hearts are still corrupt. Okay? They're not doing it exactly as the Lord would call them to do it, and they are not doing it for His glory. Those are the three elements that need to be present in order to do something that is honoring to the Lord, and let me just say at the outset that no matter how hard we try, we still can't do it exactly right, which is why we need the Lord Jesus to make what we do acceptable to God. But the Spirit of God does enable us to do this to some degree. By the way, uh, the Westminster Confession also answers this interesting question. If, if what unregenerate men do, unbelievers do, when they actually do what God commands is not pleasing to God, then should they do it at all? Well, it goes on to say, if they neglect it, that's even more sinful and more displeasing unto God. So it doesn't please Him when they do these things, but it displeases Him more when they don't do these things. So again, just an interesting point here that we need to, um, need to think about. But again, this answers the question how we can glorify God. If we want to glorify Him, if we want to please Him, then what we do has to have these three elements. First of all, what we do, what we offer to Him, has to come from a heart that is purified by faith. And I think what, they, what's, what they're saying here is that it, it must be done in love. Okay, as we come into the world, our hearts are corrupt. There's no love for God in our hearts. Those hearts need to be purified. There needs to be love in them. We do know from the scriptures and from our own experience that the heart, the affections, they are the source of all of our actions. We only do what we want to do. We call that free choice. And that is, as a matter of fact, something that each of us has the power to do. We can all do what we want to do, but the point here is we're only going to do what we want to do, which is why Solomon tells us in Proverbs 4, verse 23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Now, if our heart, which is the source of all of our actions, happens to be evil, then what that means is we're only going to want evil and we're only going to do evil. Jesus says in Mark 7, verses 20 through 23, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Whatever is in the heart, that's what's going to come out in the life. By the way, that's the reason why the, the Pharisees were so repugnant to the Lord because most of what the Pharisees did uh, that was offensive to God was offensive because of why they were doing what they did. They did it with evil motives. Pharisees, again, Jesus was warning us again and again in the Sermon on the Mount not to do our piety to be seen by men and otherwise we have our reward in full, but rather do it secretly. Whenever the Pharisees did what they did, they did it out of an evil motive to display their piety outwardly so that others could see them and admire. They did not do it inwardly as the Lord calls us to do it. They didn't do it because they loved the Lord and they wanted to please Him. Without love, 
We cannot please God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3, If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. The Lord says we have to have essentially both things. We have to have right actions that come from a right heart if we want to please Him. That's why Jesus says to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 25, and listen carefully to what He says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Now, this is exactly what the uh, Westminster Assembly is talking about, right? The Pharisees cleaned up the out outward, you know, the, their, their act, and they looked holy before people so that people could praise them. But Jesus said, you've only cleaned the outside of the cup. The inside is still full of evil, robbery, and self-indulgence. Instead, you need to clean the inside of the cup out first. You need to have a heart purified by faith so that your life will become clean also. It won't be an act, but it will be a reality. Our hearts must be cleansed by faith. Now, if we have trusted Jesus, our hearts have already been cleansed by faith because that's what the Spirit of God does when He applies Jesus to us. He cleans up, as it were, the wellsprings of our hearts by pouring into them love. You know, we talk about uh, imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what justifies us when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. His righteousness is given to us, and we are declared righteous by God, but our hearts are changed at the same time, and that's done by an infusion of the Holy Spirit into our hearts. He pours this love, which is essentially not so much that He's pouring love in our hearts, but He is uniting Himself to our souls and creating this love. Now, this is what gives us the faith that we needed to trust in Jesus in the first place. Uh, but it also, of course, gives us a transformed life. Paul writes in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. The fact that we have this love is the reason why we want to give glory to God. So the first prerequisite to, to pleasing God has been given to us uh, by the Holy Spirit through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now secondly, if we want to please and honor the Lord, then we have to do what we do according to His rule, according to His Word. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we would love Him, but also so that we would love the Word of God, so that we would live a life that is pleasing to Him. God gave us the Word to show us how to do this. And again, we know that from what Paul tells us plainly in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. That's what we're doing here. For reproof, I think that's going on here as well. For correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped, for every good work, we need a heart purified by faith. We need that love for the Lord and for His Word. We also need the Word to show us how to do it. So we need, if we want to please the Lord, we need to study the Word to learn what God wants. I think we need particularly to study the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments are basically a summary of how the Lord wants us to live. Uh, and they're, they're very expansive, they're very broad in their application. As a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, God gave us a book in the Old Testament, which I think is what, 31 chapters long, that uh, is really meant to apply these Ten Commandments to life so that we would know how to live a life that is pleasing to God. That book is the book of Proverbs, written by a man who was endowed with the, the greatest measure of wisdom that God has ever given to anyone. We read in Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 5, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, 
to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Basically, Solomon is telling us here that this is a book for everyone. Whether you're young and ignorant, whether you're wise because you're older and you have more experience, this book will bring you to a deeper level of how to understand and apply God's word to your life so that you might please him. But again, we do need to remember it's not enough simply to know what it is that God wants us to do. We actually have to do it. If we want to please God, we need to think about, as we're faced with any particular decision, what is it that the Word of God, what is God telling me in His Word that He wants me to do? Because if I do anything other than that, I'm not going to please Him, right? I'm going to displease Him. We need to do what we do out of love, but we need to do what He is calling us to do. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ didn't just know what the Father's will was and didn't just approve of it and think it was a good thing to do, He actually did it. And our Lord Jesus calls us to do the same. Uh, the Lord also says through Isaiah, and think about how this impacts how we should view the Word of God. Isaiah 66 verse 2, but to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Do you know that most evangelical Christians today don't even pick up the Bible and read it to see what it says? Most people who go to churches don't do it. But how many people are there that, that pick it up and read it? How many times have we picked it up and read it? We know what God wants us to do, but we choose against it. We choose not to do it. We do things we shouldn't. We don't do things that we, that we should. If we want to please the Lord, we need to take what he says seriously. We need to be as our Lord Jesus, right? And his meat and his drink was to do the will of his Father and to accomplish his work. And then finally, all that we do needs to have one goal, and that is it needs to be aimed at the glory of God. Now, that's what we were looking at this morning. Remember in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Paul says, whether then you eat or drink, and again, it's talking about uh, things that we have liberty to do, do it all to the glory of God. Make sure that your eating and your drinking is pleasing to Him. Make sure you're using it to serve others and not just please yourself. We uh, read in our meditation in Colossians 3, verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. In verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We do need to remember the reason why God made everything that he made. You know, he, he didn't make this world and put us in it so that we could seek our own pleasure and do our own thing. But he made these things for his glory. He made us for his glory. He redeemed us for his glory. We saw not too long ago in Romans 11, verse 36, for from him, that is God, and through him, and to him are all things. He is the source of he is the one who made these things. He made them for himself. To him be the glory forever, Paul says. Amen. Now, if that's the reason why God made us, if that's the reason why he redeemed us, if that's the reason why he gave us his Holy Spirit so that we would want to do this, if this is why he gave us his word so that we would know how to do this, this needs to be the purpose behind everything we do. It needs to be the reason we do all that we do. Remember the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, first question, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so here I think we need to take a step back and we need to look at what it is we're doing. You know, 
why we're pursuing the things we're pursuing, why we spend our time the way we spend it, why we're praying for the things that we're praying for. And ask ourselves, are we doing these things for God's glory or are we doing them for our own? I mean, we all have a particular vocation in life and perhaps, you know, it, it's ahead of us, perhaps it's behind us, perhaps we're in the middle of it. <clears throat> but we do need to ask ourselves this question, why did we pursue this in the first place? Now, if we weren't believers at the time, of course, there's not much we can do about that. But why are we doing what we're doing now? Is it because this is what I believe God made me for? This is what I believe he wants me to do? Or is it something that, that I want to do? You know, we think about what the Lord calls us to do in Scripture when he says, you know, husbands, love your wives. Why do you love your wife? Why would you do this? Well, sometimes we do it because, well, if I, if I don't do it, then... Uh, things are going to get hard for me, you know, and uh, it's going to get kind of rough inside the house. Or maybe I do it because I want some love in return. You know, you, we all like to receive love in return and the same thing, wives toward their husbands or parents toward their children. But what's the main reason why we should do these things? It's because the Lord calls us to do these things and because we want to please Him. And so we do it out of love for God. It's not that we don't love our spouse. It's not that we don't want to receive love. There's nothing wrong with that. But the main reason needs to be for God's glory, first and foremost, to honor Him. When we pray for the salvation of our children, our family members, and our friends, why do we ask the Lord for these things? Well, sometimes the overarching reason is because I love them so much, I don't want to see them perish. I want them to be saved. But you know, the main reason we should be praying for this is the main reasons why the angels rejoice whenever a sinner comes to faith in Christ is because their Lord is glorified when a lost coin is found, when a lost sheep is recovered. There's more joy in heaven over a sinner that repents than over the, the 99 that don't need repentance. We should desire these things primarily because it gives glory to God. And when we seek after these things for that reason, the Lord is, is more honored. He is more glorified uh, by that, we may find that a number of the things that we, we do, or the number of the things that we ask the Lord for, we're doing more for ourselves than we're doing for, for God. But our lives need to be directed at the glory of God. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ, He didn't seek for His own glory. He wasn't looking for fame and fortune. He wasn't looking for a comfortable life. He didn't do the things that he did to make things easier on himself, but everything he did in order to please his heavenly Father. And that is what our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to do. You know, if Jesus had not done that, then we wouldn't be saved. Remember, he prayed in the garden, if it's possible, let this cup pass. You know, he didn't want to have to go through the cross and the wrath of God on the cross and so forth. If it's possible, Lord, that they can be saved in any other way, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I know you sent me into the world to do this, and I'm going to go through this for your glory and for your praise. Jesus didn't go through that because it was an enjoyable experience. Okay? He did it because he wanted to glorify his Father. If George Whitfield had been seeking, again, his own pleasure, he never would have gone through the things that he went through to bring the honor that he did to his Lord. You see, you can't seek your own things and the Lord things and expect to honor the Lord in the way that these honored the Lord. The Lord says again through Paul, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So let's be reminded this evening uh, that that's what the Lord calls us to do. And let's seek by his grace to get our aim straight in the things that we would set our hearts to do uh, for the Lord in this world. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to help us to do this.